guys, it's Hannah and this is Book Worms Talk. And today I am going to talk about No Year But Fear by Renee Carlino. I'm super excited to have got to read this a little bit early, but oh, it's one of my favorites. I've just come to realize that everything that Renee Carlino writes, I'm just gonna end up loving. There's no questions asked. This was really funny. Oh my gosh, it was funny. The protagonist, Kate, was just really relatable because she was so spunky and she thinks she's tough and she is tough. But you know what? She isn't tough all the time, and it's just so hard to describe her, but she's very spunky and feisty, I think is the word that's often used, but I really, really related to her. But without spoiling, I am going to jump into an actual summary and less of, this book was just so good because I could just sit here and say this book was just so good, but let me give you actual things. So Kate, remember we talked about her about 0.2 seconds ago? She is a kind of jaded reporter from Chicago and she's lost her spark. And kind of in an effort for her boss to help her get that spark back, he gives her this exclusive story. And so she goes to Napa to interview this guy, RJ Lawson, who is very reclusive, kind of next Bill Gates sort of guy who is like child genius, but he's not in the social light. He's very, very reclusive. Let's just say her and RJ don't exactly hit it off. He had a lot of issues with him. He was just a misogynistic asshole, okay? I had a lot of problems with him, but I love their insults back and forth. Like, I hated it, but I liked it. It's like that thing with arguments where you're just like, ah, oh, ooh. But so her saving grace in this whole thing is she runs into one of the workers there, Jamie, quite literally, like runs her car into his. She's not a good driver. And because she has so alienated RJ, she then kind of depends on Jamie to give her an idea of what the winery is like and what the grounds are like and the staff and just how it all works because she needs to write this piece because she's been writing fluff pieces on flavored gum and lipstick and that's just it's not her and she knows that and it's because the woman who's basically raised her since the age of eight who was her mother's best friend rose had died and she's just been in this really horrible funk ever since that's not really a spoiler i think because we find that out within the first chapter i believe so not really a spoiler. But while she's there, she does get a bit of her spark back and we get to witness that. She gets to talking to Jamie and it's just this really sweet, this is, okay, this book is what contemporary romance books should be. This is what they should idolize to be. This book, this is the definition of like the perfect contemporary romance. It's sweet, it's funny. The second half actually I think is better than the first half. I thought the first half was great. Second half, I was up till wee hours of the morning reading. Your sweet thing was Renee's first book, which I actually, on side note really faster, I think you should read that before you read this. If you don't want to, go ahead and just do this, but there's a little cameo of Will Ryan in here, so I mean, you'll appreciate it more if you read that one first. But there's this extra little something. It's not just about this romance. Oh my God, that is what I love so much about her stuff. It is about family, it is about belonging, it's about you know finding herself and her own place, this mantra for her own life. Is that even how you say it? I don't know. I probably sounded really dumb. Mantra, ma mantra. I don't know. I'm just trying to get it. There's this little something extra with it. It's not solely this romance, and that's what I appreciate so much with it. And then towards the end, I'll talk about it in the spoiler section. Just come back when you read it. I can't babble about this. I can't talk about it. It'll so spoil it. So on that note, come back when you have read this because I don't want to spoil you because there's two pretty big twists that I didn't see coming. And that says a lot because I'm like on top of things because I read like Consequences, that whole series. I got very good at predicting things and I don't know why I did not predict this. I was kind of like, why, Hannah, why? So I will see you guys later when you have read this. Please, like for real, don't watch this if you haven't read it yet. It'll ruin parts of it for you and it won't be the same. So just, you'll finish it fast. It's 300 pages. So I'll see you guys later. Bye. I really loved just Bob in this because it was like the mantra of, I'm all I've got and you're all you've got. But I love how that was corrected in the end and that whole part, that was the part I was jumbling about earlier, trying to say, I can't talk about it, I'll spoil it. But it was like that extra something that really just set this thing like into the six star rating part zone thing. <sighs> Work with me today, words. Okay, so very quickly, I want to mention because if you have read Sweet Thing, you know that Renee Carlino is like taste in music on point. I mean, Van Morrison, oh my God. But just because this book isn't centered around music necessarily does not mean that her impeccable music taste does not shine through. I mean, we had Miles Davis, Jose Gonzalez, and the Black Keys, and they were like, just to mention a few, and I'm just like, yes. Oh my gosh, when Kate said to RJ during their interview, the Verizon guy called, he wants his glasses back. 
It was so juvenile, but I loved it. I would totally say something like that. Okay, let's be real. I would hope that I would think fast enough to say something like that. Okay, so how Steven and her were, at first I was like, oh, it's the, it's the boyfriend thing that they're gonna automatically break up, but then we got into it and it was how he just didn't know her. They were together for so long and like he couldn't remember the vegetarian thing. He made me so mad. No, he was so, so real of a character. He wasn't this little, I don't know, silhouette of that ex-boyfriend character, you know, like that thing that's temporarily in the way, like he was a character. And that's what I have a problem with in most books that this book did not have. A plus plus. And then we get RJ's whole story and I thought maybe his whole reason for why he was such an ass to her. We found out about um, the car accident with his mother and I was like, maybe because he found or overheard her telling Susan that she ran into Jamie and the car accident thing like triggered that memory and that's why he was mad at her but no that, that wasn't it but see it was placed in such a way that it made me try to make it fit to why he was that way and not that oh it's obviously Jamie so well done I didn't see it okay so th this is the point in which I'm going to just read a couple of things that I just found superbly beautiful I've been looking for the same thing most of us are looking for what's that someone to come home to. Ta -da! And this part is when Kate is on the phone with Jerry and she's on the date with, I keep wanting to call him Will because Will is in this, when she's on the date with Jamie and she goes to the bathroom to talk to Jerry. And she says, I don't know what I'll do if I fall in love with him. If you fall, let him catch you. That was the moment where I was like, oh Jerry, you poetic little shit, I like you. So she had this recurring dream of Rose in a casket and she was like struggling and she she was alive anyway when she was always not able to hear what it was or remember what it was that she whispered whisper being a very key word remember that I say that for a later part she was never able to recall that but then this time she was when there was a conversation with Jamie it was after he hit um, his low oh my god that part I was so freaking out but then she remembered because she said we take care of each other and then she remembered in the dream what it was that Rose whispered was take care of each other and then she turned and she saw that it was Jamie that was with her and that part was kind of like she could have just imagined that but then this later part convinced me otherwise again with the whispers thing I so appreciate the before and I mean right before that they slept together that Kate began asking him all of these questions and it's so reporter of her and I would have felt that it wasn't it wasn't her if she didn't ask this I thought it was really funny too do you like me, Jamie? Yes, a lot. What blood type are you? Oh, positive. Do you have a savings account? Yes. And health insurance? Uh-huh. And you've had a checkup recently? Yes, of course. And your last name? No more talking. Well, we find out about that part later, but you know, she got answers. Some. In books, when they don't have those kind of basic answers, not even like the savings account thing, but just basic knowledge of the person, it's one of my biggest pet peeves. It's like, you don't know shit about this guy, and you're just gonna sleep with him willy-nilly, and I just said willy-nilly. Ooh, okay, that was a face. Um, but this is the part that I definitely have to read because it's all oh, one of my favorites. I guess I had to sing because it was. Love is not the same thing as marriage or a relationship or having children. Love is not work. Love is a feeling, pure and simple. It's a feeling you can have one moment in which you believe you can throw yourself in front of a speeding train for someone and it can vanish the next when they tear your heart out and steal every last beat for themselves. Her article. Damn, if I read articles like that, I would be an article reader more often, but I never end up running across stuff that's just that good sounding. <laughs> oh, the last line. My advice about RJ Lawson would be this, drink the wine, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Just seriously, were you a reporter in the last, what the plus, last life, last next life, what? That sounded like a rap song. You were a reporter in the last life or something. When we found out that RJ stood for Ryan James, I immediately stopped reading and I was like, hmm, let's think about this 2 a.m. Hannah's brain. James, Jamie, ho? Oh? But the thing was, I didn't find that out until about a paragraph before the protagonist did. So I'm like, I didn't suspect a thing right until the moment of. Oh man, and then when we found out that the reason that he left that morning was because, oh, was because of his father and the heart attack, they, like my heart just sunk. I was like, oh, you conclusion jumper. So he left voicemails on like a nightly, daily basis just to say hi and say what he did that day, to say goodnight, and I just, 
Oh, and then this part that was right after it, that was one of my favorite lines. The messages made my heart ache, but it was a good ache. Somehow it felt like a healing ache. It's like the pain you get when the skin around a wound tightens up. Ah, oh, the skin around a wound tightens up. Ah, oh, so good. I need to think of other word of good. Brilliant. Amazing. Amazeful. Awesome sauce. Can I just make things up? Oh, and when we found out about Bob, oh, oh, finding out about Bob necessarily, I mean, that was a little bit sad, but then when I freaking read the note, I held it together until that point. The reoccurring thing of take care of each other, the fact that that's what she heard from Rose before she read this note, and then she read this note in the whispers, the whispers. Remember the whispers, second time I've mentioned them now, because I'm going to tie them together. If you didn't tie them together, it's in the epilogue. I will get there, I promise. And then Bob left her the room with a view. That isn't fate. I don't know what it is, because that's exactly the book that Jamie had left her that he said was his favorite. The poet's part. I'm going to read you it. It isn't possible to love in part. You will wish it was. You can transmute love, ignore it, muddle it, but you can never pull it out of you. I know by experience that the poets are right. Love is eternal. And that is what Bob had highlighted, and I'm just like, fate. That was in a really scary looking face, I'm sure. Oh my god, the famous Titanic discussion about she could have fit him on the door. They could have both fit. And then that's just when she was calling Beth and she just transferred over to the next line without even thinking about it and then ended up being Jamie because he has his nightly call where he just says what he did that day to say goodnight and that he loves her and all that cute stuff. And so that she answers. Then Jamie stopped calling her every night and she realized that and then so she went to the mailbox and I mean everything just exploded out of her mailbox. And the note that he had left her about his father and he said that he loved her at the bottom of it and she wrote why and sent it to him. And he sent it back to her and then he wrote, marry me. You know what? She even said this, that it's so fit for their situation because in any other circumstance, a note via mail it would be so not charming or romantic or anything, but it so fits for them and I 100% agree. Then out of nowhere, and I really do mean out of nowhere, I was in total shock. She's in the L, which is like the subway train thingy majiggy. There's one other guy there and he, he approaches her um, pu puts a gun to her and it's over the head with it and that I'm just like Duh. Just the fact that she wasn't shot is a miracle in itself She's mostly out of it. She's in this coma and she had this thought and I'm actually going to go back and read you something from sweet thing But don't worry if you haven't read it. It won't spoil it But it's something that kind of ties the two together and that's what made sweet thing for me Just that one part that I will get to but first I'm gonna read this the thought of Jamie losing me was harder to accept than the thought of losing Jamie not because I didn't care for him, but because he would be in pain, and that gave me more strength to fight than anything. I loved him and could not stand the thought of causing him pain. And now I go to find the sweet thing thing. <laughs> it's the only way to know you're really in love. When you ask the question, would it be harder to watch him die or to know he'll watch me die? Is there more mercy in being the one who does the watching or in being the one who does the dying? It's when you realize what mercy killing actually means. It's when you actually care to the point of tormenting worry. You see the common thread here? And I just fell so hard for that part in Sweet Thing and that was just a clear shot reminder. And I appreciated the little things in this book. It is what made their relationship very real world. The fact that they had a fight because I am a firm believer until you fight with someone, you can't just I don't know, marry them, for instance. If you don't fight with them, how do you expect to, oh, I don't know. I think it's one of those things that you have to have happen before you marry someone. It's one of my own personal things. And so I really loved that they had a fight. It was over something stupid, but something I so, it, it, it fit for them. So there was a phone call made to Kate's house and Jamie got the message for her and it was from this man, Paul Sullivan, who was looking for her mother and she met with him and explains that her mother had died and she was wondering if he was her father and he very quickly dismissed that and gave her the name of somebody else which she then found out was not the right guy and she goes back to Paul and he kind of, he talks to her and he says, you know what, the time period, it fits and they find out that he was in fact her father and she's always felt like throughout her life since Rose is gone and her mother is gone that she's very much alone and she finds that he has this big family, he has 
his kids, so she has you know, these sisters, and she does have this family, and she has nephews, and she's, I don't know, it's this extra thing that I was talking about, how it's not just romance. Okay, so when, so she has this obsession with finding the holiday train, and when they were walking there, her and Jamie, and she noticed that the sign said Merry Christmas, but Mary was misspelled. It was not spelled M-E-R-R-Y, it was spelled M-A-R-R-Y, and she's just like, hmm, those are misspelled. And then when they get there, uh, they have, he has Santa Claus. He planned this whole thing out, by the way. Um, Santa Claus goes, ho, 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 marry him instead of Merry Christmas. And I thought that was kind of cute, but the whole sign thing is really what sold me because I'm just like, okay, getting this guy to say, ho, 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 marry him is one thing, but the freaking signs, that, that got, that was yes. And then she finally rode the holiday train and you know, that was her new memory of the owl. One thing common in books and not particularly contemporary romance books, but it's, some, it's sometimes there, but is the I own you shit. The feminist in me just, does, I, I cringe. And so I particularly loved this. Jamie said, I'm just looking at you, at what's mine. Listen, sailor, you don't own me. I'm not yours. And I was just like, female empowerment, thank you. I cannot express enough how tired I am of the you own me. Bullshit. I just the page. I'm not going to go into a feminist rant here, but I loved that Okay, so you know that thing that I was talking about that I was like jabbering and I couldn't really explain well because I was like But, but the spoilers and I can't and I um, just found it if she were to give advice She would say something along the lines of leave your life leave everyone you love every care every stress every commitment live alone understand what it feels like to know Understand what it feels like to know that if you go into cardiac arrest, choke on a piece of hot dog, or get electrocuted, no one will find you. You'll rot. No one will mourn you. Imagine this feeling haunting your thoughts for the rest of your life. You'll wither and vanish, and some stranger will take care of your things and your burial, and you might not even get a placard. Imagine that. Live it. And let yourself believe that you should be alone. And then go back to the people who love you. That is what I would preach. That is the challenge I would present. Gratitude is the quality of being thankful and the readiness to show appreciation in return. On my journey, I learned what it felt like to live. To live is to be grateful. I got, I got a little bit of chills here just now. I, oh, favorite part, easily. That was the little something extra that this had that contemporary romance novels just don't have. Books in general just don't ever have. So they do get married and I forgot how poetic Will Ryan could be. I mean, this? To exist in each other's souls so strongly that you are bound without a physical tie is the greatest mark of love. <sighs> I forgot. I want to reread Sweet Thing. I don't reread books ever, and I want to reread that. And then later on that evening, when she told Jamie that she was pregnant, he said the best thing I loved you before you existed, and I'll love you after I'm gone. The I love you after I'm gone thing, I was like, I got a little misty eyed. I was cool until the love me after I'm love you after I'm gone thing. I just together. Okay guys, so the whispers. I'm gonna finally talk about that, right? I've been mentioning that and dropping it and like, pay attention, I'm gonna talk about it. I'm talking about it. Whispers, that's what she calls them. They're signs, small sounds, or little reminders, letting you know that there's something bigger than us out there. That there's this force working hard to make things right in the universe. The whispers is like this recurring theme of fate, and I think fate was only actually said as the word fate one time. Aside from this epilogue, which I think he does say, everything else it was just whispers and it, it keeps the cynics a little bit more open-minded, I think. I, as the person who seeks after the ideas of fate, caught on to it, but that's because I'm a seeker. That sounded like some kind of thing from the host. <laughs> I cannot recommend this book enough. It's, it's one of my favorites, easily, up there, right with Sweet Thing. I love this thing to pieces. So I want to know what your favorite parts down there, your favorite quotes. Let's let's try to do quotes. You guys have a different copy than me slightly, so you might have it a little bit differently worded. So down there in the comments, please. So I really hope that you guys enjoyed this. And check out my book talk for Sweet Thing that I have. I will be reading Sweet Little Things soon. So stay tuned for that because I think I actually might read that next because I love this and I need some more Renee Carlino in my book, in my life, my book, my life, my life. Anyway, my book talk for Sweet Thing will be down there in the description. And I will see you guys later next time, but we'll talk. Bye.